welcome to this course on question digital documents or forensic digital document examination. The topic comes from the fact that most forensic disciplines suggest specific questions that are being asked. If you, for example, think about DNA, in the case of DNA, the question is primarily, does this sample match that of a specific donor? Yes or no? Yes, there are some additional questions that can be asked, but that's the primary question. Um, in the case of ballistics, the questions are, was this round fired by a specific weapon, or specific type of weapon? What was the trajectory that the round followed? Uh, what tool marks did the gun or the rifle leave on the casing before it was ejected and so on? So all of these questions, very specific, uh, in some cases it's a small set as we've seen in ballistics, uh, but still very clearly indicated. In toxicology, the question is which uh, toxins have a victim ingested uh, before the victim died or something else happened. In question documents, the question is, is a document authentic? And again, we can explore uh, what this means in, in a variety of ways, but the basic question is fairly simple. In digital forensics, we do not have such a specific question. Uh, the field is wide open in terms of the questions that are asked. And therefore, I want to narrow the focus. But before we do that, let's look at a couple of physical documents that we may want to authenticate. We, we may be in doubt about the authenticity of the document. And I've brought along a couple of treasures. Here, for example, I have a DVD signed by Catherine Jenkins. Hopefully it's worth a lot of money. Um, picture of Mr. Bean, personally signed by Mr. Bean. Again, hopefully that's a lot of money. Um, Signed picture of Vinton Cerf, father of the internet. Again, hopefully worth a lot of money. And, and with all of these signatures, in, in this case, they deal with collectibles. But very often, uh, we will have signatures at the bottoms of contracts. And those contracts may be disputed. And then the question becomes, did the person who purportedly signed the contract uh, really sign it? But let's look at my other treasures that I brought along. I brought along some money. That's a lot of money. Um, it bothers me slightly that these $200 notes do not quite look the same. But still, I think I'm wealthy. Uh, not quite a treasure, uh, but um, I have a problem with someone who sent me this ransom note. And I'd really like someone to do something about this. Um... I've also achieved a couple of things in my life. This uh, is a certificate that proves that I have flown on a tiger moth as a passenger, unfortunately, not as a pilot, but still, uh, I can prove it. I've got the certificate. Look at all the nice gold and stuff on it. Must be authentic. Uh, here I've got a government check issued by the South African Reserve Bank. Uh, when I deposit this, I may, be, may have 8 rand 66 more in my account. And obviously, the value of these items depend on their authenticity. And that's why I want to determine, whether, why I want to prove that they are authentic. Slightly different question that we have with the ransom note, but still a question that we want to ask about its origins, where it came from, and very often it's the same with authenticity. We want to determine its, authentic, its origins. Uh, did it come from the purported origin? In this module, we will make extensive use of a paradigm proposed by Inman and Redern. In this paradigm, they say that forensic science can basically answer five questions. It can answer questions about identification, classification, 
individualization, association, and reconstruction. We'll return to those five questions in more detail later on. One of the assumptions of Inman and Redern is that they are working in a world of divisible matter. So as a sixth principle, they added that something must be divisible um, for a paint uh, to, to leave a mark, uh, let's say two cars are in an accident and paint is transferred from car A to car B and from car B to car A, then the paint on both car A and car B has to divide in order to leave the trace. In digital forensics, we do not have that notion. We can make perfect copies. We can leave traces of events that happen by simply making a digital copy and there's no need to try and divide a bit. It's impossible to divide a bit um, in any case. Uh, by stipulating that the Inman and Redern uh, paradigm works in a world of divisible matter, they are in essence saying that they are working in a field where matter is physical. S formally, or stated slightly differently, they are saying that they assume that we are working in a world where physical properties exist. In other words, they are talking about a physical world forensics. In digital forensics, we are working in a digital world, in cyberspace. And the question that I've been, been asking more and more regularly is it not the case that digital forensics is on par with physical space forensics? In other words, both of these may be seen as umbrella terms. The one is an umbrella term for the physical world, we would talk about physical documents, physical bullets, and so on. And the other one is an umbrella term for things in the digital world. And if we begin to ask that question, then the next obvious question is, what are the things that are in this digital world? And I contend that in a lot of cases, we may have crossovers from the digital to the physical world and vice versa. If we ask questions about physical documents, specifically about the authenticity of physical documents, then we may also have to ask questions about the authenticity of digital documents. And the obvious next step would then be to say, let's think about a possible discipline that we can call questioned digital documents, and that is the counterpart of questioned physical documents. Now, not all branches of physical forensic science will have digital counterparts, and not all parts of digital forensics will have physical counterparts. But what I want to do in this course is to explore this one single topic, this one possible counterpart, and then leave other counterparts for subsequent courses. So a question here that I'm beginning to ask is, does it make sense to talk about a subfield of digital forensics? And then we will begin to ask the questions, what does such a field entail? Um, is there anything that, uh, that, that does it enable us to focus our work more specifically? Does it provide us with an opportunity to get a better scientific foundation for this specific sub-discipline that we are now calling questioned digital documents? One word about terminology, uh, the term questioned document is used very widely in, digital, in the field of forensic science, but almost as a synonym of that is the term forensic document examiner. Uh, perhaps questioned documents is a field and a forensic document examiner is the person who works within the field, but we can also call the field uh, forensic document examination. 
and we can also talk about a questioned document examiner. So I'm going to use these two terms interchangeably, whether it is a questioned document or whether we are talking about the field of forensic document examination, that will be the same and the, the same will apply to the digital counterpart. I will use uh, questioned digital documents and forensic digital document examination basically as synonyms obviously uh, depending on whether it refers to the field or to the practitioner I may change my terminology somewhat. This course will consist of 10 topics. Every topic will consist of one or more videos and in uh, this very first uh, topic, the introduction to the field, we will use two videos. This video will conduct a number of physical examinations on uh, question documents. And the second video that forms part of this introductory lecture is one that deals with aspects of the law. Uh, I should point out that I am not a, an expert in physical document examination. I am not an expert in uh, legal matters. So my intention with both of these two topics is to provide a general background. I don't want to give any specific details. I'm not going to try and authenticate uh, any of these documents properly but I will hopefully leave you, the viewer, with some feeling for what the field is all about. And what I hope will happen in over the longer term is that we will get a discussion amongst uh, digital forensic scientists and uh, questioned document examiners and that we will be able to talk one to one another, get the terminology better established and broaden the scope and in the end collaborate. So let us start with our examinations of all the uh, precious materials that I brought along as show and tells for this lecture. So, As promised, let's examine these precious artifacts that I brought along. And first up is this DVD signed by Catherine Jenkins. Uh, about this video, or this DVD, I attended the show by Catherine Jenkins on the 11th of March 2011. And afterwards, she was willing to sign DVDs, so I bought a DVD, I walked over to her, and I asked her to please sign my DVD. She took out the pen, she signed it, uh, I just heard her singing, I knew it was her, it was not an imposter, so I know that this is an authentic signature. So, by examining this signature, I'm not going to try and find flaws with it. I'm going to try and see what an authentic signature on such an object may look like. It may obviously look different depending on the object, uh, type of paper, if she signed the DVD rather than the cover, it may have led us to other results. But the bottom line is, this serves as an example of something that I can personally testify to as being authentic. Let us look at this signature using a magnifying glass. In fact, what I'm going to do, I'm going to scan it at a pretty high resolution and then we should be able to see some details that are not available or visible to the naked eye. So I'm going to use this uh, relatively old scanner, but it should be good enough for our purposes. It's a photo that I'm going to scan. I'm going to use a bit more color depth. I'm going to increase the resolution of the scan to 6400 dpi. That's the highest optical resolution that the scanner allows. So uh, there's no point in trying to go higher than that. And uh, then to save the file eventually, at the moment it is set to save it as a JPEG file. As you probably know, JPEG files are compressed because in typical pictures, 
there is very little difference between adjacent areas. A little bit of blue here differs very little from the blue there. It's a lossy compression technique as well. I need something where I can get all the details crisp without loss. So I could use a bit map, but a TIFF would be a better option. Going to say OK. And then I'm going to ask for a preview scan of the cover, which is currently on the flatbed of the scanner. And uh, we should get that in a moment. So there we have it. The part that I'm interested in is the signature. And the signature is sitting over there. Let's scan that and it gives me the options that I've already specified, so no problem there. It tells me that I'm going to get a huge file with these scan settings, but that's fine, I expected that, so we're going to continue. And you may see that I'm scanning about 40 millimeters by 90 millimeters. Not much, but it's going to take a while. As you can see on the timeline, our scan is almost ready. So it uh, took a couple of minutes and generated a rather large file that it has to write to disk. And we will soon be able to see it. There it is saving it and it is available for inspection. And we can open it up and uh, turn it to horizontal and there is our signature as scanned in. Going to get rid of the border quickly so that we can uh, use more of the screen estate to explore the signature. Looking at this magnified signature, there are a number of features that stand out and they may be of interest to a forensic document examiner. Remember that I'm not a qualified forensic document examiner, so I cannot make uh, any claims about the authenticity of a signature based on the signature. But uh, some of the highlights that seem interesting to me at least are things like the strokes. Uh, for example, if one looks at that stroke, you can see that the pen was put down there, there is some ink release there, and then it was probably moved across the page rather rapidly because it seems to, to dry up there. Uh, maybe I'm assuming too much in, by assuming that it was drawn down because I cannot see whether it was drawn down or drawn up. It just seems more natural to be drawn down. Uh, one of the cases where I can see directionality is in this particular line. So let's zoom in on it a little bit more. So what we have here is a stroke that starts there and then crosses the page and then comes to a stop and then turns back. Now, from this magnified image, I can see that this line coming back covers the line going to the right. So I know it must have been made at a later stage than the line going to the right. It then goes up and it comes down. And yet again, by coming down, it's covering a part of the underlying letter. So I know this was made later. And then finally, it crosses that horizontal line, that long horizontal line, because it covers it. You can see how it crosses over it. Uh, and in this case, I do have uh, an indication of how that stroke was made. I can see it from the ink that is deposited on the page. Uh, I can also see over there that the pen was put down, but perhaps more importantly over here the pen was lifted, and as it was lifted, less and less of the tip made contact with the paper. I know this was a fiber-tipped pen, so uh, this would probably be something one would expect from a fiber-tipped pen, uh, that some of the fibers lift before the others 
and uh, that would explain why it narrows down in that way. Uh, fiber tip pins are known by a host of names throughout the world. They're known as marker pins. Uh, they're known as felt tip pins. Uh, they are in the United States especially known as Sharpies very often and in South Africa we tend to call them Koki pins. So I'm going to talk about a Koki pin and at some point we'll have to look at uh, ballpoint pins and other writing instruments to make some sort of uh, distinction between the traces that they leave. Uh, Looking at the signature, a forensic document examiner may uh, look at various other characteristics. We've already seen things like directionality. We can begin to infer speed by the loss of ink. Um, also pressure, uh, because where more pressure is applied, more ink may flow. Um, we can also look at the handwriting itself. Uh, the height of the letters, the height of letters that extend above normal letters, and also the way in which letters are formed. Uh, question whether the uh, I is always left undotted, or maybe that is the dot above the I that uh, is present there. Um, and uh, we can even look at uh, some of the other uh, characteristics, uh, drawing X's and so on. Uh, again, you can see the sequence in which the, the lines were drawn, and that uh, may give you an interesting insight into how this person tends to sign, especially if uh, that is typical uh, given her signatures. So one aspect of these signatures is whether it matches the known signature of the person whom it purports to belong to. Uh, and all these features that I've been speaking about uh, speak to those characteristics. That's what so one would expo expect the signature to look like. However, uh, another question that comes to mind is whether the signature could have been copied. Uh, it could have been copied in two ways. Um, the one option is that it became part of the original image and was then printed out and every printed copy had the signature in place. Uh, um, an interesting facet, uh, if we zoom in on this, you can see that this picture exists of what looks like little circles. And uh, what is or seems to be a very smooth space, when you look at it from a normal distance, suddenly becomes these dotted patterns. Now, that tells us that, uh, or rather, these dots are characteristic marks of half-tone printing. In black and white half-tone printing, you would print a sequence of black dots, and the size of the dot will determine the darkness that your eye will perceive. So if you have a, an area that's almost white, or even purely white, you may print a lot of tiny dots that the human eye may not perceive directly. On the other hand, if you have an area that should be black, you will print large dots and uh, your eye will connect them and it will seem like a solid black. This is obviously not a black and white uh, half-tone print. This is a color half-tone print. And to get a color of tone print, one would use the same technique, but one would use four colors, the four uh, complementary colors, uh, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, also known as CMYK. And if you look at these little circles, then you will see that they exist uh, or they consist of these four colors 
and the relative size of the colors determine the overall effect. Um, to go to a part of the image where there is a little bit of a picture, you can, for example, see the dancer at the bottom here, and what your eye perceives to be more or less black is indeed predominantly black, but the other colors are still present. They are just smaller. The black dots are much, much bigger. On the other hand, if you go to the dancer's arm, you will see that magenta is probably the overriding color, but it is balanced by the other colors so that it looks like human skin tone. And when you get to this white reflection here, the dots all become so tiny well, not all of them, most of them become so tiny that it's almost a white, uh, just a few colored uh, dots remaining here and there uh, to uh, give some color to the image. Now, the reason why this is important is if this image was printed uh, using uh, half-tone printing, and the signature was included in that original image, one would expect that the signature will also consist of dot, little dots like these. However, if we go down or go to the signature, then you will see that uh, the black lines here do not consist of uh, the circles they are completely black except for those areas where they didn't cover the dots specifically and you see the various colors shining through um, in fact uh, if we go to an area where there is a bit more detail if you look at that area over there, uh, that area over there, you can see that what is on the inside uh, of the black line and on the outside of the black line use what looks like the same dots, uh, same sized dots and so on. Um, here you do not see the black dots becoming extremely dark uh so it, it the, the this black of the pen uh, uses a different uh, mechanism to convey blackness there is something else to note here if you look at uh, the signature you will see that the edges of the signature of the line are very very smooth they may not look all that smooth immediately but if we go back to our dancer and you look at her arms, you will see that what seems like a straight line is not a straight line at all. Your eye tends to make it a straight line because the dots are so small and you therefore perceive it as a straight line. On the other hand, uh, just to go back now that we've looked at those, you can see these uh, straight lines, even if we zoom in to an extreme magnification, they are straight lines. So what this tells us is that the background was produced uh, using off-tone printing and the signature was produced using something else. Again, I know that it was produced by the owner of the signature shining it but uh, what would have been possible is that you could have used a very high resolution scanner scanned this original and then you would get the half tone scanned in and you would also get the signature with its almost three-dimensional characteristics scanned in and you could have printed that so how we can exclude that option had we not known that this was an original would have been a really, really good question. Okay. It is time to look at the second extremely valuable document that I possess, 
this one signed by Mr. Bean. I bought it on eBay. Yeah, I know it's crazy to buy such things on eBay because you probably cheated every time. But still, I have high hopes that Mr. Bean actually signed this picture. And one day when I retire, I'll sell this picture and I will live on the returns that I got from my investment. Let's start the investigation. Our examination of Mr. Bean's signature again starts with the scanning of this image. I have already scanned the preview and the signature is presumably that area. So again, uh, high risk scanning, uh, parameters set correctly. Uh, I'm just going to click OK again. It tells me that it's going to be a huge file. It will be a while. So let's fast forward. Scanning is done. It's saving the file and I can open it up. And what we see here is, first of all, again, the half tone printing that you would have. What you saw in the earlier uh, signature case ex as well. Um, let's zoom in on this a little bit. Uh, this is clearly black and white and you can see that there's reason for some concern here. We in the previous case we got our very very straight edges in this case we are getting jagged edges and while the white areas consist of mostly white with tiny black dots it would seem that the black areas are black and contain tiny white dots um, it seems that this signature was printed or could have been printed so uh, I don't get any stroke information I don't get any dynamic qualities here I can't see anything about the uh, letters uh, again if I had some exemplars then I could have compared the heights of the letters and the formation of the letters but I think I have a more serious problem here I think I've been cheated one place where we may find exemplars of Mr. Bean's signature to compare our signature on our picture to is eBay. Well, let's go to eBay and then we're going to search for Rowan Atkinson signed and that will hopefully give us some things that were signed by Rowan Atkinson, hopefully include something signed as Mr. Bean and uh, that may give us an indication of uh, what the signature should like, what we would expect. So there we do find indeed a couple of hits, 31 hits. And um, one of the first things to note here are the prices that are being charged. So we are talking about documents that are in principle valuable, in principle cost a lot. Um, however, uh, one should also keep in mind that these prices that are charged are not necessarily paid. People may put up something on eBay for ages, hope that they are sold at some point at those ridiculous prices, but it costs very little to keep them up on eBay and uh, one should not uh, take this as an indication of the real value of the item. So there are a couple of pictures. Um, there is one that looks like uh, Mr. Bean. And um, I guess uh, what we can see from that is that the signature looks very, very different from the signature that we have. But okay, this is signed uh, as Rowan Atkinson not as Mr. Bean. So let's look at what else we have. Um, just uh, by way of a simple comparison, 
there's another uh, example of what may be Rowan Atkinson's signature. Remember that we hope that these things that are sold on eBay are authentic, but we can't take that as uh, the truth uh, without uh, enough evidence to, to believe that it is the truth. Um, scrolling through the options, there is an interesting one. That one looks very much like the picture that I have, except this one is not signed by Mr. Bean. There's nothing in the top there uh, that says anything about Mr. Bean. And then signed Rowan Atkinson again. Um, price, uh, 275 British pounds about 6,300 South African rand. So again, in principle, something that is very valuable, very costly, if that is indeed authentic. Uh, scrolling down further, there is the picture that I have. It seems like the exact picture that I have. But uh, one of the aspects that you will see here is that this one is pre-signed. So that indicates that it was signed before it was printed. And that's sort of the impression that we got uh, from uh, looking at the scan of the picture. So that's consistent with what we expect. Um, scrolling down a bit more, uh, many of these pictures are indeed of Mr. Bean but uh, they are not uh, signed by Mr. Bean per se, but there we have it. Rowan Atkinson as Mr. Bean, and everything looks pretty much like my picture. What we have at the bottom is different. Uh, that in inscription, this is me, is identical to what I have, but this little arrow points towards Mr. Bean's head and my picture that arrow points to Mr. Bean's neck so uh, this raises some serious questions um, I wonder if the claim here is that this is a, an original signature uh, I'll have to read the description to see whether that is indeed the case um, and if it is the original, then maybe mine is a copy of that one. You can think about that. So I'm not making a, uh, any assumptions about this one, but I do want to look at this picture in more detail to compare it with what I have. There are the two pictures side by side. On the left-hand side is the picture that I own, um, the one that was purportedly signed by Mr. Bean in person. And on the right hand side is the one that I've just found on eBay. And you can see that there are many similarities. That is the same picture. Uh, maybe the positioning here is slightly different. The one on the right is a bit higher and so on. But uh, what fascinates me is the fact that this signature moved. Uh, there it is right at the top. Here it is much lower. And I wonder how those two compare. I can begin to compare the letters and say the T is connected to the H and so on. But there may be a more effective way of doing this comparison. To continue our comparison... I have opened the picture that I found on eBay on the left hand side. I have taken the picture that I have, uh, that I own uh, from, uh, and I've opened it and I have uh, isolated the text on it. Removed the background and all that we have that remains here on the right hand side is the text. I also rotated it anti-clockwise by about one degree. Um, and I can now compare it with what I have found on eBay. And uh, voila, 
it seems like a perfect match. Now, what I know from this is that, that both of these cannot be originals. Uh, there's no way that the text will align that perfectly if an individual were to sign two items. The spacing that you have between those two words, um, the uh, exact length of the words, the I's dotted, uh, somewhat strange, R over here, there's just absolutely no way that two authentic copies can align in this way. Therefore, I know that at the very least, one or perhaps both of these have to be uh, fakes. Uh, and uh, I've already concluded that mine cannot be original. Let us continue our search for signatures by Mr. Bean on eBay. Just looked at that one. Uh, so going back, there is another interesting one. It is exactly the copy that I have. We can probably go and compare that again in size and see what it looks like. Um, so uh, I'm afraid this seems to be available all over the place. What I do see though is that this is a pre-signed card. So it is something that was signed before it was printed. They're not claiming that it is original. So as long as you understand the words, it's probably fine. This is a copy of a signature, not a signature. Uh, taking it further, it seems we've reached the end and uh, nothing really else that points to a signature by Mr. Bean. However, there was one that I missed while scrolling through here and that is that particular one. Here you can see that uh, Rowan Atkinson seems to have signed it, but you can also see the Mr. Bean. And this is me. Uh, two excerpts from uh, the abstract or the signature that I have. Both of those appear. And I can go and compare them to, to see uh, how well they match. Whether I also have mirror images there. Or that whether that happens to be unique. Um, here you can see that they seem to claim that it is uh, signed but careful those two letters mean reprint so again they are saying that this is a copy so i'm not going to try and explore it this is a copy uh, they not even claiming that it is original again as long as you know what those two letters mean uh, should read the description to see whether they spell that out, but that's beyond what we want to do right now. So, it turns out that my investment in Mr. Bean was a waste of money. Oh, that's so sad. And uh, I even got a letter from a certain company along with it that set, uh, that told the story of how the signature was obtained from Mr. Bean. I don't trust this document anymore. This is probably a forgery. Uh, I also got the envelope, or part of the envelope at least, uh, that was used to send it in 2006 to its original purchaser or the person who obtained it originally. Now the truth is, I also contacted Mr. Bean's agent, actually Rowan Atkinson's agent, obviously, and they were friendly enough to inform me that they had bad news for me, that they never dealt with the company who purported to have obtained the signature from the agent and sent it to them. So I guess there's another indicator, another way of finding out if you follow the creation traces of a document and the evidence is not supported uh, by the facts uh, of the matter, you can also probably conclude that it is fake. But Mr. Bean was not my only investment. 
Remember that I also got this one, also from eBay. Uh, okay, uh, Wind and Surf. Let's hope Wind and Surf will pay for my retirement once the university no longer employs me. Let's do the examination. So let us examine this signature. Clearly there is a V and then there is the I. Uh, the N seems to be a somewhat upside down N, which leaves us with more or less three spikes there. There is the T, so Vint. And then surf is more or less C, E, R, F. Uh, nice clear signature that is uh, very legible. Uh, looking at the signature itself, the, the, the way it was reproduced, we again see the sharp edges that we encountered in the Catherine Jenkins signature that we knew to be authentic. Um, we can see Koki Penyu, so where it was picked up and where it was put down. And uh, we, we can see some of the three-dimensional aspects that we also saw in the Catherine Jenkins photograph or uh, signature. In fact, here you can see that this line crosses over the F as it comes down. And if we look at the higher side of the F, you can see that the F going up does not disturb the coming down line. So uh, the coming down line or the part that comes down crosses over the part that goes up. So again, we can determine the sequence in which this was made. A uh, couple of uh, pressure marks here where we can discern that the pressure was perhaps not as high as elsewhere, or the movement was fast. Um, I do see some white spots here, and that was uh, a question in some of the earlier uh, signatures, specifically in the Mr. Bean case, uh, the fact that we saw those dots in the signature was a giveaway that it was printed on top. However, uh, I'll get back to these dots in a moment or two. Um, looking at this picture, I also see something else that looks very faint. And zooming in, there are scratches on the signature. So let's move the signature over to where it encounters some darker spot, let's say there, in that corner. And... Uh, the scratches are visible on the signature, but there are no scratches on the background material. Uh, that is completely clean. Uh, and as we move around, there is a scratch and it doesn't affect the, uh, the background. So that would suggest to me that uh, very light scratches were applied here, the, the picture came in touch with something, it was put in a sleeve or something, and that caused scratches on the, on the signature, but not on the background, uh, which would suggest to me that the signature was applied after the background, that uh, the two materials used are not the same. In fact, talking about the background, you can see that this is clearly not halftone printing, this is proper uh, photo printing, and what we get from this uh, are no specific printing marks as such, um, which would mean that the detail that we see in the signature can also be reproduced with the same amount of detail that the background is reproduced. Uh, it's entirely smooth, both the background and the signature, and therefore I find some hope in the fact that the scratches only uh, affect uh, the, the signature, nothing else. Now looking at the characteristics of the signature, um, you can clearly see the, the V, and then the I, and the N is sort of an upside down N, giving us those three spikes. Uh, Looking at the 
T, it seems to start there. Uh, so there's a little going in movement there. It comes down, it crosses, and then it makes the horizontal line through the T. So it seems to be a rather specific way of taking the T, going around the bend, and then crossing the T, uh, and then possibly moving to the C as we see here. Um, going into the C, there is some ornamentation there in the sense that uh, the C has a slight curve. It doesn't go straight into the C. It goes down to pro form a proper C and then the E and the R and the F are follow again that E there, there's a slight circle in it but it's in essence a line that goes up and down and the R is also in essence a line that goes up and down the F comes down and then stops dead at some point that's what I am surmising from the signature. So again, what I need to do now is to find exemplars to compare it with in order to determine whether this looks like one would have expected. This is an unknown signature. I bought it and uh, hopefully uh, the money that I paid for it was well spent. Question is... Where can one find exemplars of the signature to compare it with? And I yet again went to eBay to find items that are put up for sale. And I collected a couple of signatures from those items. A problem, of course, is that uh, we hope that those things that are put up for sale are authentic but we don't know that. So to do a real comparison, we would need the exemplars that we know are authentic. But what we will do in this case is just simply assume that these exemplars are authentic and proceed from there. Remember yet again the disclaimer, I'm not a document uh, analyst, so I cannot uh, make uh, authoritative judgments but I can, uh, like any uh, novice, look at some of the things that one can observe. Uh, first thing to observe here is that most of these V's in the signature are pretty consistent. Uh, there are minor differences, and one would expect minor differences in the various uh, signatures you don't always make your signature in exactly the same way sometimes uh, you are signing something that is on someone's back and that may affect the signature and so on so uh, we should be very careful with our interpretations here with our comparisons uh, so the the v's look fairly good uh, very promising um, I do see uh, some sort of an artifact there, uh, downward bent, that I didn't see in the other signatures. Uh, we noticed that the I and the N typically form three upward spikes. So there's your spike, spike, spike. There's also spike, spike, spike. There's spike, spike, and not obvious that there's a spike. There's a well, spike, spike, spike. Um, not sure what to make of this one. There's a spike and a spike. Um, and But the, uh, it does seem to suggest that we have uh, three upward spikes. Again, there is something that bothers me a little bit, but I don't know whether that is significant or not. The same here, I see a dot above the eye, and again, I don't know whether that's significant or not. I can just, uh, uh, comparing to the rest, note that it is not present in the other signatures. 
Um, the T, as we said earlier, very often starts at the top. This one seems to be a continuation. And then it comes down, and there it's hardly visible, but you can see that it goes up and then crosses the T. So the T is indeed crossed by an upward motion, a continuous movement from the bottom of the T and then crossing. And in this case, the name is separate from the surname. Here again, you can see the T coming down and then coming up and crossing over. Uh, there it is uh, perhaps more visible, but the strange thing there is that it goes backwards before it crosses over. Um, in, in most of these exemplars, it seems to go forward, but not in all of them. So again, I, I can't make a specific claim. Um, there is a very clear example of a T again uh, coming down, also going backwards. So maybe this is something that changed over time. Here is something that is dated, and it's dated 2020, and you can see the line coming up, going backwards and crossing over, but there is something dated 2010, and the line is also coming up backwards and then crossing over. Looking at the C, we do see some ornamentation in the C uh, in most of these examples. That one is not an obvious, does not contain obvious ornamentation. There is some sort of ornamentation, but I'm not quite sure about that. There is some ornamentation, even though the C is again separate from the T. Uh, looking at uh, the E and the R, they do form upward spikes in most of the signatures that I have here. Uh, the E sometimes a bit more round is like an E one would expect. And then the F going up, coming down and bending to the right. F going up and then coming straight down. The F uh, coming straight down. Uh, if coming straight down and so on. There is an example of where it bends slightly backward. There's another example of where it bends slightly backward. So uh, clear variations in the direction in which it bends in this set of examples. The line going across um, seems to be obvious that it starts over there because there is a dark spot, there is a dark spot, there is a dark spot, and then it crosses over, and in some cases there seems to be a blunt stop, whereas in other cases it looks more like a swipe. Um, there, again, you can see the swipe. You can see the swipe. There is a blunt stop. There is a swipe. So while the, the start of the line seems to be fairly definite, whether it's a swipe or something that stops bluntly, I am not sure. But uh, the salient characteristics of the signature that I have seem to be present in this uh, set that I have collected that are, as I previously said, is hopefully an authentic set, but I don't know that. So at best, I can be optimistic that the signature that I have is indeed authentic. Let us just quickly return to these white specks that we saw earlier. In the Mr. Bean case, we know that they were printing artifacts, so it helped us to prove that that uh, signature was fake, that it was not an original signature. In this case, if we look at these uh, white marks, we see that they seem to be uniquely shaped. Everyone has some sort of a shape uh, that uh, differs from the other shapes, and that would suggest to me that they are pieces of dust that got stuck in on, on the picture. Um, it's possible that they even got stuck uh, while the ink, ink was wet. Uh, 
else one would be able to blow them off or dust them off, which I've not been able to do. Uh, I haven't tried too hard, but I have uh, tried, gently tried to remove them, and I did not succeed. So perhaps I should just quickly check how much my treasure is worth. And there you can see some prices. Recall again that uh, these are asking prices. It's not necessarily what people are willing to pay. Uh, thankfully thus far I've not seen the picture that I think is original here yet. So um, yeah, there you go. Uh, it seems the father of the internet is not worth as much as Mr. Bean. That's a pity. So, I'm uh, rather optimistic about this one. As far as I can tell, this is authentic. So, still looking for money for my retirement, and I found this old check. Clearly signed by some officials, uh, but not original signatures. You can see that those are stamps. Um, there's another little problem with this, is that this check is only valid for three months and it was issued on the 30th of May 1985. So, I guess I'm out of luck again. I'm not going to live from that either, but I still have cash. At the current exchange rate, this is worth many, many South African rands. Yeah, as I said, it, it bothers me slightly that they don't quite appear the same. There are color differences and so on. Uh, the paper here doesn't feel, oops, uh, doesn't feel, okay, so I guess that one's out. This one is a bit more of an issue. May maybe it's valid after all. I can put it on a light table and look at the watermark and that sort of thing. Uh, in general, people are more used to looking at the validity of currency. Uh, they know what the features are in currency. So we are all amateur document examiners to identify or used to identify uh, the authenticity of currency. Let's now move to my certificates. In fact, uh, I showed you this uh, impressive certificate a little bit earlier. Now, the, the fact that I've been a passenger in a plane, it's not worth much. But just imagine how many degree certificates are forged and how many people get work based on uh, forged certificates. So, while the authenticity of this particular certificate doesn't make much of a difference. The authenticity of certificates in general is a big deal. Now, how do I authenticate that? Um, let's just briefly say that, uh, hard to believe, but I found the second one. And that enables me to compare the two at least. If that company is still in business, then I may even be able to determine from them whether uh, they indeed issued such a certificate. So that is a whole specialized field on its own, not going to explore it in much more detail. Let's now move to this uh, liability. This ransom note that I received was clearly typed on a typewriter and I think I know who typed it. Let's do a little bit of an uh, in examination to see whether uh, I can identify the culprit based on what I've received in the ransom note. This is a close-up of the ransom note. Clearly typed on a typewriter or at least it seems to be. Presumably this is not a very intelligent kidnapper because uh, 
number one to ask for ransom money at the PO box is arguably not a good idea because that PO box belongs to someone. And number two, at the moment, our postal service is not working, so to send money to a PO box is not going to achieve anything. Now, the issue here, uh, the should be a comma after again. Uh, grammar police. It should should have been a comma after again. So clearly not a very intelligent uh, scammer. But what we want to do here is we want to analyze the text. So typed on a typewriter, this gives us a feeling of what typewritten text looks like. Um, the various almost uh, ghost images of letters. Uh, for example, I, F, the, at the beginning, if. Uh, that F has a ghost F next to it. And then the Y of U also has a ghost Y next to it. And so on. That will probably tell a proper document examiner uh, something about the person who typed this. Uh, because you don't always see these uh, ghost images in typewritten text. Interesting, the dots that we see in various places, for example, in the zeros of the 200. Um, this is not printed on any sort of dot matrix or half uh, tone printing. As you type, the hammer moves towards the paper and it pushes the ribbon forward and loose dust particles on that ribbon will probably end up on the paper. Almost like gunshot residue uh, when you fire a gun and some power residue remains on the hand of the person who fires it. Here we see some of that residue in all these loops, uh, the A in cash as well, and in a couple of other places. So uh, we'll have to examine quite a couple of other examples to, to get a clear feeling of what this normally looks like, but this is enough for us to work with. So at this point, we assume that the uh, investigation has somehow narrowed it down to two possible typewriters, and we want to determine which of these two typewriters, if any, uh, was used to type this note. Two typewriters are a Remington Quiet Writer and an Olivetti typewriter that unfortunately doesn't have any model number on it. And therefore we will simply refer to it as the Olivetti typewriter. Here we have two exemplars typed on each of these two typewriters in question. Let us zoom in on some of the characters produced uh, by each of these uh, typewriters. Uh, given that we live in a pretty digital world, the at may be an interesting character to zoom in on, even though it was not used in the ransom note. Here you can get an idea of this at, what this at looks like. And we will just now zoom in on the Remington's at. We can also, while we have it on screen, look at the pound sign, because the pound sign was indeed used in the ransom note. And uh, it uh, looks like a capital L, and then it has two parallel lines going through it. Let's now zoom in on the Remington machine's uh, two characters. Now, unfortunately, the reproduction quality is not very good here. But one of the things that we see immediately is that the core, the A in the at, is much smaller. There's a lot more white space around the at. Looking at the pound, we again have the L that we had previously, but there's only a, one, a single line through it. 
So this means uh, we should be able to distinguish between these two machines fairly easily by looking at the pound sign in the ransom note. In order to facilitate comparison, we have copied the lowercase characters from the two typewriters in two separate lines exactly above and below one another. Looking at those characters one by one, it is hard to find differences. Uh, sometimes there seems to be a difference, but very often it may just be the fact that the ink ribbon used for the uh, Remington is slightly more degraded. One of the clear differences is in the letter G. For the Olivetti, the G at the top, you can see that that G has a very flat bottom. On the other hand, the G from the Remington, the bottom G, has a much more roundish shape at its very bottom. The next possible difference to look out for is the letter M. On the Olivetti, you can see a tiny stroke moving in from the top left-hand side before it goes downwards into the first downward stroke of the M. On the other hand, the Remington has no such stroke coming in from the left. There is a tiny stroke that starts above the M and it continues straight into the M. It's not entirely clear that that is uh, the nature of the letter but from what we see on the exemplar, it certainly seems to be the case. Yet another possible difference may be seen in the letter T, where the T seems wider in the case of the Remington, but we won't uh, spend too much time on that one. To further simplify comparison, we have those three characters that seem to be different, the pound, the G and the M, from the Olivetti, from the Remington, and then also from the Ransom Note. The simplest one to compare is obviously the pound sign, because the differences between the Olivetti and the Remington are very clear. The double lines in the Olivetti, the single line in the Remington, and on the Ransom Note, a single line. So we have a clear suggestion that this was typed on the Remington. The G's uh, on the ransom note are somewhat more roundish at the bottom. They are not as flat and as elongated as the G on the Olivetti. They look much more like the G on the uh, Remington. So again, it suggests that the Remington was used. With the M, we saw that the stroke coming into the M on the Remington came in from above, whereas on the Olivetti it came in from the left. Just to double check that it is not a matter of just a poor ribbon, in the Remington name itself you can see another M and it also comes in from the top. In the ransom note there are four M's and in all four cases the stroke that starts the M come in from right above the main stroke that forms the first downward stroke of the M. So again, this suggests that the Remington was used. Uh, based on the differences, we can conclude that the Remington was used. Obviously, we should also compare the other letters, those that were not different between the Olivetti and the Remington, because they may be different on the ransom note. And if they are different on the ransom note, if they differ from the Olivetti and Remington typefaces, then it means our initial assumption that either the Olivetti or the Remington was used is incorrect, and we will have to look for another typewriter to find the origin of the ransom note. The characters that we've just looked at are probably the same across different machines of the same type. So our conclusion that this was typed on the Remington in general will only be a conclusion that it was typed on a Remington of that particular uh, model. 
However, if we only have one Remington that we suspect, it may be sufficient. In general, you want to be more specific. And what you need to do is to move away from class characteristics to individual characteristics. Individual characteristics are things that are unique to certain typewriters. You may, for example, find that, let's say, in the top part of the S, some dirt gathers on a particular typewriter. Then it means every S that it types will have a dark spot in that S. Um, in this uh, example, it is clearly not the case because there are other S's where, we're, well, all the S's are clear uh, as we want it, would expect them to be. The same with the E's. That's another spot where you can find dirt marks. Perhaps something else that may be uh, unique to this particular machine, we see irregular spacing. Um, after the A in cache, there's a pretty big space. Um, the A followed by the N in want seems to be big, but that may just be perception. I'll have to measure it to be sure. Uh, same with the space following the A uh, just before the T in at. Um, so... Are these seemingly irregular spaces or si spaces of irregular size, are they specific to this individual typewriter or are they generic or is it just my perception that the spacing is irregular? I'm not sure. We'll need more typewriters and conduct a fairly wide examination to be certain of any such uh, individualization attempt. Issues around question documents can have extremely important impacts. Look at, as two examples, the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Hitler Diaries to, to find examples that had a, an impact on history as we know it. The 10 topics that we will look at during this course are displayed on the screen right now. You will see that we will fairly quickly move over to digital aspects and begin to look at things within the expertise of a digital forensic scientist. In the next video of this topic, topic one, we will look at legal systems and how they play a role uh, also as background to our real topic of questioned digital documents. We will also soon move to topic two, the differences between authentic documents and fraudulent or fake documents and see that it's not always a binary division, that it's something is not necessarily authentic or a fraud, but it may be somewhere on a spectrum between fraudulent and authentic. Talk again soon.